chapter 10 is where I'd like you to turn today. Uh, I've entitled this, A Hostile Environment. A Hostile Environment. And we run into those quite often. I remember even when I was a kid, or not when I was a kid, when my kids were younger and still at home, they used to play video games. And they had this one, it was kind of like military-based. And there was, uh, you know, you, you, they would set me up on that thing. And they'd say, okay. And they would set the stage, and it would be like a an abandoned warehouse or something, and we all had guns, and we're, we all had our own screens, and I'm trying to operate this, this controller and trying to find my way around, and I hear my kids giggling, and come on. I, so I look over at their screens, and I find out that they're all right behind me, following me around here, just waiting just to find a good time to, you know, do something uh, you know, to shoot me or something right then. And it's, I felt like, man, they're ganging up on me. It's a hostile environment. Some of you probably say, you know, it's like driving on the road. Uh, you know, that, that can be pretty hostile. Uh, semi uh, passed me on the way to church this morning, and Kim says, man, I wish he would kind of get in his own lane when he passed. And, and I said, well, he doesn't want to go in the median. I understand that. But... Um, but, you know, it can feel like everybody's out to get you. And there's a lot more, though. You know, how about um, taking something, returning something to uh, Walmart? That seems like, you know, right now, or even maybe before that, you know, when there's, I remember when, you know, they had the Black Friday. I don't know if they do this anymore. I haven't been out on Black Friday in, in years. But I remember how pushy people were. You know, it's just like, it's, it's okay that you can have this. I don't, you know, I don't need it that bad. And it just seemed like we, we face this hostile environment all over the place. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. If you remember earlier in chapter uh, 10, Jesus had named the 12 disciples and then he was going to send them out and he was giving them instructions. And so two weeks ago, we talked about how he had sent them out. Um, he told them to take very little with you, go out there and proclaim the gospel. And um, this is still part of that. I'm going to pick it up, and I'm just going to work through it verse by verse here for a while. So look at chapter 10, verse 16. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Is interesting. Uh, part of the, one of the things we have to understand is what the Israelites would have thought when they heard this, and they always saw themselves as gentle sheep, and they did not see themselves as being wolf-like at all. That was the Gentiles. They were the vicious wolves. By the way, we have a tendency to do that. We we have a tendency to overlook anything negative that our country might do, and. Um, and so that's something that um, will continue to uh, be the case probably. They also thought of false prophets as wolves. They uh, were spoken of that way. And what Jesus is saying, he says, avoid those dangers as much as you can. Be as shrewd as a snake, but remain innocent. And that kind of throws a wrench in it, kind of, you know, we, we say, okay, we're going to stand up. And, 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 and what we end up doing is being very aggressive sometimes and uh, not remain as innocent as we should. So Jesus is telling them, you're going to go out there and there's going to be this persecution. And I want you to notice that, first of all, it's by the church. It says, be on your guard, verse 17. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, on my account, well, we'll just stop there. The, the local council was run by the, the synagogue, basically, and so it's kind of the same thing here. And what he's basically saying is you, you're going to be attacked even by your church, and it hurts to be rejected by your own people. I mean, that's, that's something you can expect it sometimes from enemies. But when it's, 
you know, your own people, that really hurts. He goes on, verse 18. On, a, on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given the words to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So now he's talking about being persecuted by civil society. He talks about being brought before kings and governors. And, you know, this is something to a Jewish person. Uh, this implies that you're being betrayed. And it's one thing to be brought before a local council, but um, it's another thing altogether to be brought before a foreign council like they're talking about here, the kings and the governors would have been. When I was in Africa, I got summoned one time to the local court authority. It was rather embarrassing. And I went there and I found out that my goat had eaten and got into the neighbor's garden, or it wasn't really my neighbor. My neighbor would have just come and told me. But it had gotten loose and it had gone uh, down the road a bit. And it got into a garden and it ate some potato leaf. They grow potato leaf there. It's sweet potato uh, leaf. But they grow that um, and they, that's part of a, a food. They, they, they make a sauce with it. It's really good. And so I got summoned because my goat ate that. And, and so I was charged. And as a missionary, you know, this was really embarrassing, but... Uh, they said that I would have to pay. And so I said, okay, uh, how much do I have to pay? And they said, well, that, that was probably about five cents worth, so you'll have to pay five cents. These are, this is local, these are local people. That's fair. I was shocked because being as an, an American, I figured it was going to be five cents for the potato leaf that was eaten and then another, you know, thousand dollars for pain and suffering that they, I might have caused. I thought, man, this is really great. This is, this is good. But, you know, you don't have that kind of ease knowing that, you know, things are going to be okay going against a foreign court. And then you start to get a lot more uneasy about things. So Jesus says you're going to be turned over to uh, the, civil, uh, the civil authorities. Let's keep reading verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. He says, you're also going to be betrayed by your own family. And you start reading through this stuff. He goes on, when you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. You read that and you think, that doesn't sound fun. I'm going to be persecuted by just about everyone. Why in the world would I want any part in that at all? And so we try and change things. We try and move things in a different direction. We try and make it so that our faith, our belief, won't cause any friction with anybody. It won't make our church upset. It won't make uh, the civil authorities upset, the world upset. It won't make our family members upset. And so we have all, all this, you know, that we, we do trying to soften things and round off the corners and make it smooth and make it work, and usually we end up in compromise. And I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't tell us that's what we're supposed to do. He says, uh-uh. He says, you're going to be persecuted. And 
In verse 24, he goes on, The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and the servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? Jesus is telling them, they call me Satan. Guess what they're going to do to you? They're going to call you Satan too. So let's read on. So, do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth far more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. We're going to stop there. Because what God is saying here, what Jesus is saying here is align yourself with God. Align yourself with me. And the first thing he points out is that God is the one with the real power. You're worried about these people who are persecuting you like they're going to be able to hurt you. And you're all worried about them. But if you have an eternal perspective, if you understand that this world is just a, a, a flash, a blink of an eye, it's just a moment in the perspective of eternity. If you understand that, be afraid of the one who can determine your eternity. Don't worry about people who just cause you little insignificant things here on earth. You see, we struggle because what we, what we you know, what, what is really not that significant, what's a little more insignificant um, you know, to us, it's a big deal. It causes pain, and so it, it, it hurts us. But Jesus says, remember this. And then he also says, after saying that, he says, yet he cares for you. He loves you. And he talks about the sparrows in there. And, and then, he, you know, he says, um, not one of them falls to the ground. They're, they're, they're you know, they, they, were, they were sold for a penny. They were sold for sacrifice. He says, not one of them falls to the ground outside your father's care. And then it says, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. And, you know, some people say, well, Tom, that's not as hard for God when it comes to your hair. But let me tell you, this, this changes quite often. It decreases rapidly. So that's a lot to keep track of. And he says, you're worth far more than a sparrow. Sometimes we struggle with saying, well, if Jesus loves us, why does he call out our sin? And I think we have to understand that from a parent's perspective. If you're a parent, you've had that experience where you've had to really be hard on your kid and it wasn't fun it wasn't pleasant for you and it certainly wasn't pleasant for them but you did it because you love them and you did it because you wanted them to be a good person you wanted them to grow and mature into the into the right kind of person and so God is, is, you know, he's tough on us sometimes. But never doubt that he loves you.
As I read this, I, I hear all these things, and when I think, you know, I, I read all these different scenarios, and I, when I think about persecution, I think of, you know, what immediately comes to mind is, you know, people being thrown in prison, you know, people being harassed, all these kinds of things. But, you know, we fear a lot more than just that. Some people are afraid to let others know that they are a Christian because they're afraid of what their coworkers might think. I had a strange, this isn't going to cost me 20 bucks, is it? Kim was telling me of a conversation she had with our daughter, Gabby. They were looking for, I don't know, something, clip the nails or something, they were looking for an item. They couldn't find it anywhere. And then le- several hours later, Kim opened a drawer right, right there. There they were. And she went and told Gabby or showed them to Gabby and said, hey, yeah, this is where they were. And Gabby said, you saw me look there. I, and I didn't just glance. I looked thoroughly. And they weren't there. And now a few hours later, they suddenly appear. And so Gabby says, you know, a friend of ours, uh, we call him, uh, they call him Uncle Joe. Joe told us that the multiverse is real. And when you didn't find it, it was in the other universe. And then when you started thinking about it, it plopped out of that universe back into our universe. And so that's why you found it. So the multiverse is real. And so we laughed about it and whatnot. But you know what? You can tell your coworker that and they don't blink an eye. But you tell them you follow Jesus and it's like, hmm. Maybe it's not your coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's your family. And it seems like we fear being fully devoted followers of Jesus because we're afraid of what somebody else might think. We might not be asked, the persecution, and it's not really that bad of a persecution, but it might be we're not invited to the same parties that we used to be. We might not be allowed into the same conversations that we used to have. And we're afraid that when people find out that we are uh, following Jesus, they are going to look at us differently. They're going to look down on us. And so we are afraid of that. And so we remain silent. Not only do we remain silent, but we never even bring up Jesus. Jesus. And I know that a lot of times people feel that nudge. They feel that nudge. You know, they're in a situation. They hear about something and they they feel the Holy Spirit nudging them saying, you know, you got to say something here. Because you've gone through the exact same experience and Jesus did an amazing thing in your life. You have the opportunity to speak into this person's life now. But you're afraid. And so you didn't say a thing. So the persecution might look a little different than what we're reading here. But let me just read that ending. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. One of the things I hear a lot is times have changed. And when people bring up a biblical standard, I get, oh yeah, that that was true, but times have changed. Well, you know, that was maybe true and okay, and that's what people did in the past, but times have changed. You know what usually is going on there? It's a fear of what others are going to think. 
instead of standing up for the truth. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about above av- a fly of an above average intelligence, he says. And it flew into a room and it saw a spider and made this beautiful web and the spider came and, and invited him, you know, come sit down, come enjoy my time or, you know, our, our, the time come and we'll have a conversation. And the fly with above average intelligence noticed that there were no other flies there. And so he told the spider, he said, no, I'm not going to go there because there's no other flies there. So he continued on and he looked down and he saw this yellow strip on the floor and there were a whole bunch of flies down there dancing, having a party. And he was about to head down there and a bee came down and said, don't go down there, you'll get yourself in trouble. And the fly said, I don't think so. There's a whole bunch of flies down there and it looks like they're having a good time. And the bee said, it's going to lead to death. But the fly saw others, other flies down there, thought he'd join them. So, you know, I, well, I, I, I have to be careful because maybe some of you, you know, times have changed, right? That fly paper, it's yellow. And they went and he flew down and he landed on the flypaper, he danced around for a little bit, and he died. We have this urge, you know, we, we, we tell our kids to avoid peer pressure. But you know, us adults, we are driven by peer pressure. It is a big problem for us. I see people say all the time, I don't care what people think. Yeah, you do. And it may be different, but it's there. It's that pressure. And I want Gaines Church to be a church of people who understand that we are have a mission, that we're on a mission. And we're not afraid to acknowledge Jesus Christ. And we're not afraid to bring up Jesus in the places where we work. And we're not afraid to bring up Jesus in the places where we play. And we know that it might lead to some people keeping their distance from us. We know that, um, you know, it, it might lead to some people ostracizing us. But we're committed to the truth. And so we are going to acknowledge God everywhere we go. So I have a blank there, I think. Did I have a thing there about um, what's your biggest persecution? Or what fear is what others will think? Or what is your biggest fear? Rachel's on vacation this coming week, and so I was trying to get stuff ahead of time. And I want you to think about your interactions. Your interactions at work, your interactions in your community, your interactions in your neighborhood. And you know, you live in West Michigan where there's a lot of people that, you know, don't have a problem with you being a Christian. Just know that you're fortunate because there's a lot of places where it's, I mean, it's, you're an alien if you, if you say that. But even here, and it's not the comfortable you know, like I said earlier, sometimes we get involved in this comfortable uh, Christianity that makes a lot of compromises. I'm not talking about that. Let's be people who stand for the truth. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you that in you we do find truth. And Father, I I pray that as we enter 2020, that we would be a people that are are absolutely committed uh, to uh, acknowledging you before man. 
And not just acknowledging you, but, you know, we we read this story and and we almost forget that that Jesus was telling the disciples this just as he was ready to send them out. Help us to know that we're sent to, Father. And help us to be bold and courageous as we witness to this world. In Jesus' name, amen.